crazy stuff. Okay, so we're going to move on to perception. <clears throat> and talk about how do we um, create reality from all the sensations around us. So what are the ways that we um, have this mental picture of what's going on in the world? <clears throat> and so we're going to look at how sensation and perception are different. And this is chapter two. <clears throat> and so here's some goals. So we're going to talk about what does it mean to perceive things? So in... Um, most people conflate the idea of um, sensation and perception. And so what does it mean to have these different topics? Uh, visual perception, particularly, because it's so interesting. Uh, Bottom-up processing, so how do we create objects from the little features? Uh, visual recognition, so how do we know what things are? And then top-down processing, um, how do I create a picture from what I'm expecting in reality? <clears throat> So what's the difference between sensation and perception? Most people think they're the same thing, and I think the distinction between them is fairly important, so make sure you get which one's which, because they have different issues. So starting with sensation. Sensation is the input into the system. So it is the raw data that comes in. It could be light, it could be touch, it's all going to the sensory cortex up here. Um, so it is, it's the, the stuff that's coming into the, to your, um, to your brain and perception on the other hand is the interpretation. So what do I make of all this information that I am receiving? Um, how do I build a mental model or a mental picture of what's going on based on all these sensation pieces? So it's important to get that sensation is the input and perception is the interpretation. So in this picture, this is an Escher, Escher picture, um, the sensation for the stairs is all the same. They're all the same angles, they're just stairs. But the perception is that some of them are up, some of them are down, most of them are crazy. It's just this idea that um, sensation is just the input and perception is that interpretation that this picture is a little wacky. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so if you've never seen one of these before, it's an ex explanation of why it's important to think about sensation and perception in different ways. So if I'm looking at this picture, <clears throat> try this pen thing, um, I could just see a bunch of blobs, um, but I also could see the dog in the picture, <clears throat> which is um, a, ch a change in perception based on the same sensation. So one of the big reasons to study sensation and perception is called the many-to-many -many problem. <clears throat> um, it's this idea that sensation is too much information. So we have tons of sensations, but we might end up at one perception. So all these different sensations, one perception. However, it's also too little information. So we have one sensation with lots of different per perceptions, especially across people. So how do we figure out what's going on because we can't just say sensation equals perception. Because sometimes one sensation is lots of perceptions, and sometimes um, several sensations are the same perceptions. So we've got to figure out how to separate these two things. Okay, so we're going to start with sensation. Uh, and one way to really think about this, if, I, if you don't believe me about the many-to-many -many problem, is called a Necker cube. Sometimes you see the Necker cube facing down this way, uh, so it's a 3D object facing towards me. Sometimes you see it facing up and this. Okay, I think it's gone back to the slide. Sorry, it had a moment there. There it goes. All right, so sometimes we facing, see it facing up and this way. So that is one sensation, solid 2D lines multiple perceptions, especially when the perception is in 3D, which is a whole another story we're going to get to later. The other thing you can do to this Necker cube is place some dots over it. Now, do you see the cube as being behind the dots or in front of the dots? You can switch back and forth. You can also see it facing down or up still. And so that's really an even better explanation of why sensation is not totally useful when understanding perception and vice versa. <clears throat> All 
All right, so down here at the bottom, uh, you see the very first MP is the retinal ganglion cells. That's the stuff in the front. That's your eyeballs. The lateral geniculate nucleus we talked about last time. We talked about crossover, how the left goes to the right. That is sort of towards the front of your brain. And this whole back system over here is the primary visual cortex. That is all the stuff in the occipital lobe. So, um... <clears throat> and a little bit of the parietal lobe. So that is a pictorial depiction of, uh, pictorial depiction, sorry, is a picture of what's going on in the brain. So this is sort of a neural net model, but it's also sort of a process model. So each one of these numbers, letter combinations, do something different when it comes to visual processing. Thankfully, we're going to go a little bit simpler, and we're going to talk about the eyeballs. So how can we uh, think about sensation uh, for vision to help us explain some of these recognition models we're going to get into. Okay. So we're going to talk about each piece separately, so if you want to kind of keep this picture up, that'll help. Um, but I'm going to move on here, <clears throat> talk about your how um, information comes into the system when we're talking about vision. Okay. So the cornea is the front part of the eye that you might touch if you are... Um, uh, putting in contacts. And the purpose of the cornea isn't just to hold your eyeballs into your head, it helps direct the light. So light that's coming in, oh, especially over here in the whites of your eye, uh, is not very helpful because there's no sensation points there, there's no sensory neurons to say, hey look, light. So it helps direct the light into your pupil. Okay, so the pupil is the hole in your eye, so the dark spot where the light comes in. The iris is what's controlling how um, how wide the pupil is. So the iris is a muscle that controls it opening and closing. And when we go into a particularly dark room, it opens up real wide because we need more light to be able to see. And then when we're outside, we get a flashlight shining in our eyes. It constrict really tight because that is where they don't want so much light. So you're trying to keep uh, an optimal amount of light in your eyes so that you can see and so that you don't hurt your retina. So the whole thing about staring into the sun, yeah, don't do that because it will hurt parts of your eye. <clears throat> Directly behind the pupil is this sort of football-shaped thing called the lens. Um, the lens is exactly what it sounds. It's like a magnifying glass. It is the focus area that, that bends the light to focus either on the retina. So if you are nearsighted or farsighted, your lens is the problem. So it focuses, but it focuses in the wrong place. So it's like constantly looking at a fuzzy movie screen, and you're like, why can't these people focus? And so what contacts do is help us readjust the lens, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and so the lens is just the piece that is kind of focusing the light. All the dirty work goes on in the retina. So the retina is the back of the eyeball. Um, and it is where everything goes from being a light wave to something your brain understands. So this is the transformation process we talked about before, where we're looking at how does it go from being an outside source, light is a wave, to something our brain understands, neural messages. And this is where all that happens, it's on the retina. So the retina is like a giant movie screen on the back of your eye, and we've already talked before about how it's upside down, first of all. But what is actually doing the processing on the retina? Well, there's two pieces, one's called the rods. Uh, the rods do night vision and dark adaptation. So rods are mainly about how much light am I getting. So this is about brightness. How um, much reflection are they? Uh, the rods also do all of peripheral vision, so everything on the sides of your body. Remember, you do have a blind spot. We'll get to that in a minute. And then the cones, which are only on the fovea, which is like the middle of the retina, uh, are color-based. So they help us process color, so if you are colorblind, um, this is what's broken. And then they also do sharp vision. So rods are doing peripheral vision and light dark adaptation, cones, sharp vision, and color. <clears throat> On the retina, there are lots of rods everywhere, but specifically the middle of the retina. So if you kind of go like, like you would look through a periscope on a submarine, this is sharp vision. So this area here is pretty much only cones. It's in the direct middle of the retina on your eye. 
And so that's where all of sharp vision occurs. So everything out here is all um, peripheral rods vision. So it's not as sharp. <clears throat> now, from the back of your eye, if you've ever done uh, the di terrible dissection stuff in, in uh, biology or seen a more realistic um, crime scene show, you'll know that eyeballs have like a big tube on them essentially, and that's the optic nerve. So there, the processing's going on in the retina. So we've got all of our rods and our cones and they're saying green, blue, sharp vision. Now what happens is all of those sensory neurons are connected together and they end up in one big bundle. So it's, it's a nerve, but it's a lot of neurons at once. So it's a whole bunch of neurons that um, exit the back of the eye and it takes all that visual information to the uh, LGN so they can get processed in the visual cortex. Now think about how fast this is. This slide took you mi mi nanoseconds to process, so this is very quick. But because of that optic nerve, we have a blind spot. It's usually about right here, um, almost 45 degrees this way, yeah. Or is it 90? 90 degrees this way, yeah. Um, at which that that's where the optic nerve is on our eye. And because there's an optic nerve there, there's no rods or cones. Because there's no rods or cones, there's no vision. There's nothing there to translate the light into something. So there's a small gap in the visual field about right here. Uh, but you're saying, I don't see a gap. And I know I've heard this a million times driving down the street. Well, what your brain does is it fills in that gap because that's weird to have like a weird black spot out here on the sides. If you do see that, go to the doctor. That's bad uh, because your brain is supposed to fill in information. So what it thinks is there, and that's the more perceptual process on how your brain fills in things that it knows should be there. And that's why you'll miss cars that are coming up next to you because your brain just sort of fills in empty roads sometimes. Um, and so your blind spot is a spot where you literally have no sensation, none, but your brain fills in a perception because it's creating this mental picture of what's going on. <clears throat> All right. So what happens after is processed in the visual system? So our eye is fairly complex. It goes through the LGN, does all this stuff in the visual cortex. Then what? Well, the cool thing is that it goes next back through the brain. So it goes all the way to the back and then it works its way forward. And so what happens once we hit the occipital lobe is there's two paths um, that it takes through the brain. Okay, the dorsal path, the dorsal fin on the top, right, is where it runs up to the parietal lobes and that is the wear system. Remember, this is the, the parietal lobe of spatial information, so this is why the brain stuff was so important in that last chapter. Um, and so this is usually called the where system. Where are things, especially if I'm going to pick something up. Right? <clears throat> the other path that we haven't really talked about is down into the temporal lobes, and that's the what system. So the temporal lobes are really important for memory, and having all that visual information will help you remember what you're seeing. So my fancy coffee cup here um, <clears throat> for the what system. So I knew where it was to pick it up and what it was in the ventral pathways, ventral being on the bottom. And then I have a fancy picture. So the where pathway is up here at the top and the what pathway is down here on the side. <clears throat> and so dorsal on the top, ventral on the bottom. <clears throat> Something really neat that's not in your book that I think is just super cool is called retinotopic mapping. Remember the retina, we said, is like a movie screen on the back of your eyes. And we've talked about how your eye, um, the message that gets to the back of the brain is flipped and scrambled. But what your brain will do, which is super cool, is it responds to the uh, it lights up or activates. Remember we talked about more electrical activity, more blood flow, um, to the picture that you're seeing in the same spot on the back of the brain. So if you're seeing something in the top left corner of a screen, your brain will respond, remember, upside down and backwards to the bottom right corner. So if you have people looking at EEG, like using an EEG, and you show them something up here, 
you can see the message being tr like translated by looking at one, uh, an electrode on the lower back part of the brain. And that's so cool. Why is that so cool? Because if you have someone who is, let's say, had a spinal cord injury and is unable to talk or move, they can spell things with their eyes by having one of these systems, look, they can look at a screen and spell out what they're wanting to say with their eyes, and then the EEG system figures out what they're looking at by where it's coming up on the screen. And I'll try to find a link to put on Blackboard so you can watch some of these videos. They're super neat. It's like I'm using, using basic brain functioning to uh, supplement the lives of people with, um, with serious injury. All right, what's next? Well, we're talking about bottom-up and top-down processing. <clears throat> so bottom-up processing is everything that is driven by the sensory information. So here's all the sensation, here's my perception on the top. Top-down processing is the reverse. So things are driven by the context of the situation. And we, pro we do both interchangeably. There's not one where it's all bottom up or all top down. It's sort of a, a mix of the two, but it's important to think about both of them. So this section, this video is going to cover the rest of bottom up processing. Top down processing is going to be in the next video. <clears throat> so the particularly the difficult part in this chapter is this section on um, edge and cell detect on and on off edge detectors and on off cells. So each ganglion cell. Okay, that's the stuff in your eye, the retina, um, uh, rods and cones, is connected to um, a whole bunch of other cells. So um, <clears throat> there's two ways to think about this. There's the visual field that is the outside world, the piece of the world that you are looking at that is outside your body. Okay, so there are specific cells that respond only to specific things in the visual field of the world. <clears throat> the receptive field is the area of your eye or your brain that responds to that particular thing. So what we're really doing is making a distinction between the things out here that our brain responds to and where they are in the brain that responds to those things. Okay, so visual field, things outside you. Receptive field, I'm receiving the information, the information, uh, the cells that work on that information inside you. <clears throat> so here's some, some interesting things. Your visual cells are not um, tied to like just one thing. They're sort of um, on a spectrum. So we have these things called on-off, off-on cells. The easiest way to think about this is for color. So if you've ever heard someone who is red-green colorblind, that's because they're red-green, green-red, on-off, off-on cells do not work properly. That's a mouthful. So what happens is you have cells like this one here on the left that respond positively to red. So remember we talked about how neurons can be both excitatory, go, 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 and inhibitory, stop, stop, stop. And so this cell on the left would be excitatory for red. Yay, we're seeing red, 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 red. And inhibitory for green. Oh, we're not seeing red, must be green. Green, green, green. And then we have the reverse. So we have cells that respond positively to green. Yeah, we're seeing green. And negatively to red. Oh, we're not seeing green. Red, red, red. So they're, they're, it's, a, it's a spectrum of things. And the other cool thing that they do is that sometimes they get tired. So when cells are firing constantly, we'll do this in the illusions section so I can sort of prove what's going on. Um, uh, so a cell's firing a lot after it's, um, it's sort of time off. Remember, there's a specific period where it won't fire again. It gets tired of firing. So when it stops firing, the reverse on-off cell, so my on-off cell, I'm firing for red. Red, 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 red. Okay, I'm tired of red. Why are we still seeing red? And then my off-on cell that responds positively to green, when that red cell goes away, so I stop seeing red, and the light comes on and it's green, the brain just sort of freaks out. And so we kind of, we can get these after images um, because these cells are tied together. And so what, one way to test that theory is to look at, like if you stare at a light for too long, which you shouldn't do, it's bad for your retina. But you'll get that little dot, that little floating dot, the little purple one. And that is because the light 
responder, the on-off one, is like, oh, praise God, that light went off. So the other one, the off-on one, is like, ooh, that light is off. That means I'm seeing the other one. So they, they kind of work um, as like a seesaw. Right? So when one of them gets tired, the other one is sort of like, oh, I'm going to respond now. <clears throat> so there are two t a couple of types of these on-off, on, off, on, on, off cells. Um, there are edge detectors. So it helps us see where uh, something, you know, one thing is on this side, another thing is on this side. And bar detectors, I've got a picture here, it's much easier. <coughs> and edge detectors are pretty important for our 3D vision. So it lets us know whether there's a vertical drop or there's an edge to the screen. Bar detectors are um, pretty important for our, like, reading. So they're both useful in both of those. Um, <coughs> But specifically, you might have an edge detector that responds positively to like stairs. <clears throat> so some examples. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've got these rectangles. And um, each level, of, each rectangle is a specific shade of gray or black. But if you look at right where the edges are on these, it looks like... Um, it's a bit lighter or darker right at the edges. And the middle is kind of the, the reverse. Okay. And that is because of our edge detector. So the edge detector is responding to that spot where it's changing the amount of light that you're getting. So that's why you sort of get this perception of, to me it looks kind of scalloped. Like they have um, lighter and darker areas or like it's sort of curved because of that light dark perception. <clears throat> um, so one thing that we are particularly bad at is ignoring lots of information. So this comes back to the very first lecture where I said we don't like to think very hard. And so one of the things that we will do is um, throw away information we don't need. So if you look at A here, in the middle they've made the edge light on, one, on the left side and the edge dark on the right side. And so you get this sort of gradient perspective here. But what you um, what you are missing is the fact to look at B that the edges on these are both the same, and so your brains can perceive light on the left, dark on the right, even though the edges of these two are the same. And so we're throwing away the fact that those are the same visual uh, sensation, because the perception is this this left side of A is brighter. <clears throat> Another thing that we do um, are these um, uh, line, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here, uh, angle perceptions, sorry. And so if I look at this top one, so stare for a while at this uh, top left screen here. So I'm going to give you uh, five seconds. Okay, now look over here at this screen uh, on the right top and what you should see is those lines look like they tilt just a little bit and you know, that's called the tilt after effect um, you can also stare at the middle here uh, and so we can do both at the same time so stare at these middle um, gray, uh, dashed bars here Great. Now stare on the right side at this circular dot, and they should the lines look like they should sort of tilt the opposite ways. And that is your on-off, off-on cells freaking out because the tilt on the other one went away. So it shouldn't look like it's tilting the opposite direction because the other cell is picking up the slack. <clears throat> Alright, so that's called the tilt after effect. Um, <clears throat> and so that is part of that on off off on thing. So when the left and right when the left sensing neurons are tired, the right sensing neurons take up the pe uh to take up the slack and vice versa. And I cannot pronounce this. I can uh, I think it's akinetopsia. I'm not sure. Um it's called motion blindness. It's the ability inability to see things move. Um, and so there's something wrong with the section of the visual cortex that processes movement. And so those, those on-off, off-on detectors are broken 
for motion. Okay, a chrono I can't even, I don't want to try. The problems with color blindness. <clears throat> Yeah, this would be complete color blindness. All things are gray. Um, and, and so what happens is that the cones are busted. Uh, most people, or most men, this is very common in men because it's tied to the uh, Y chromosome, um, <clears throat> is uh, red green color blindness is the most common. So the red green cones are broken. Blue, yellow, sometimes you'll get. Um, but to have a complete lack of color uh, is this fancy word here, chromatopsia, and um, is pretty rare. <clears throat> and I believe, let's make sure we didn't miss any slides. Great. Uh, that is it for this section because we're trying to keep the videos a little shorter. So be sure you go and watch the next section where we're going to talk about top-down processing um, and how we use specific cues in our world to understand all of these features.